Welcome. We'll get started. It's, it's good of all of you to, um, to come today that, that um, the, the course has, has lured you away from the first day of summer for an hour. And um, on the way over here, Professor Scary reminded me that today is Patriots Day. And so uh, an appropriate day to be discussing the Patriot Act, uh, among, other, among other themes. I first met Professor Elaine Scarry by correspondence from Sweden. I was working at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, and that institute published a, a, a lot of books that, that very few people seem to read. And uh, one of them was called Incendiary Weapons, weapons that, that catch things, put things on fire. Uh, and someone who had, had read that book with care and used it in her own, her own work was, was Elaine Scarry, and we uh, began corresponding. It's an enormous pleasure to introduce Professor Elaine Scarry, who is the Walter M. Cabot Professor of Aesthetics and the General Theory of Value. She won international renown for her book, The Body in Pain, The Making and Unmaking of the World, considered one of the most significant pieces of, of literature about questions of torture and war, as well as a number of other themes uh, of the past decades. For today, we've been reading Resolving to Resist, Local governments are refusing to comply with the Patriot Act. And um, some of the other topics that Professor Scarry has, has written on include the social implications of beauty, the meanings of consent, images of labor, the causes of plane crashes, as well as dreaming, gardens, English novels, and several other topics. And in each of these fields, her work is considered quite distinguished. Please join me in welcoming Professor Elaine Scarry. Um, is, this, is, it, is my microphone on so that all of you can hear me? Yes? Can you hear in the back? Okay, can you hear now? Okay. I thought if I could start with the first question, if, if we knew you when you were a student, a college student, would we have seen the, the beginnings of your later public engagement uh, in your life at that time? Hmm. I'm not certain about that. And first of all, after checking the microphone, let me just say how pleased I am to be here. I, I always love com coming to Brian Palmer's class, and not just because he gives such a nice account of me, but because I, I know that uh, the, the students who are taking it are interested in such important issues. Now, as for my own school days, I think that as a student I was interested in literature and I was very interested in political philosophy. I wrote a senior thesis on two of Shakespeare's plays, the Roman plays, uh, Julius Caesar and Anthony and Cleopatra. So that that kind of brings together an interest in exquisite language and literature and concerns uh, actually about the way in which private and public come together as they come together in the piece that um, Brian Palmer asked you um, hurriedly this weekend to, to read. And um, I would say though that, that gradually over the course of studying literature, I have been interested in the kinds of issues that all of you are, are also interested in um, by three different paths, and maybe we'll have occasion to talk about them, but I'll just name them for you. One is the path of non-exemption. I feel as though no matter whether one is a school teacher or a taxi driver or a grocery clerk or a lawyer, one has an obligation, uh, Socrates, uh, called it the, the, uh, the duty to justice argument, one has an obligation to try and 
reaffirm good arrangements where they already exist and bring them into being where they don't yes, yet exist. The formulation I've just given you is the formulation that the political philosopher John Rawls gives of that duty to justice argument, but it really begins with Socrates. And there's no one who is exempt from that. If you are a scholar, it seems to me you have a special obligation just because you've probably got some ability to read and write um, or, and, or, and to even perhaps to speak in public places. So you're not exempt and you may even have a bigger obligation because you've got the tools that can help you reach people. So one path is the path of non-exemption. One path is uh, the privative path. And Brian Palmer mentioned that I started by looking at physical pain. And I was actually um, aware of the absence of literature that tried to describe physical pain. Some of you may know Virginia Woolf's statement that the merest schoolgirl, when she falls in love, has Shakespeare or Keats to speak her mind for her but just let someone get a headache and language at once runs dry. That was Virginia Woolf, but that was something I had noticed as a student, that here my beloved canon of literature was able to express everything I most cared about that was common among all of us, but also everything that was extremely uncommon, and yet it almost never dealt with physical pain. Uh, there are notable exceptions. So, I began to, to look more closely at why that was the case in literature, and that led me to look at many other arenas where either artists or physicians or Amnesty International workers or people working at the Stockholm um, International Organizations try to use language to assist those who are in pain to find the language to, um, to express it, and by expressing it, help bring about interventions which will diminish it. So the second path is the privative path, the path of pain. And then the third and happier path is the, the path of beauty. And uh, maybe I'm talking too long and should, no, I should, okay. Well, the path of beauty, uh, with the, to give you a, a thumbnail sketch of, of how this would work, um, there are lots of people who believe that, that beauty has nothing to do with justice or injustice, and that's a completely reasonable view. Some of you may hold it yourself and, and have a kind of art for art's sake view of literature. It's, it's my own belief that beauty greatly assists us in attending to problems of, um, of injustice. And in fact, the, the reason it, it, it does so can be seen if you look at the different ways people talk about beauty. That is, sometimes when they talk about beauty, they talk about the beautiful object, which might be a vase or a landscape painting or a poem by John Keats or your younger sister's face or uh, you know all kinds of things. Sometimes when people are talking about beauty, they're talking about the, the, the reaction of the person who sees something beautiful. Um, and sometimes when people are talking about beauty, they're talking about the long-term effects that beauty has on you. And one thing that I argue in a little book called On Beauty and Being Just is that at all three of those sites, the beauty works to, um, to assist us to a greater attention to the injuries of the world. And um, I'll just give you the middle one, the, the perceptual act. What, how does the perceptual act um, assist us in caring about injuries? The best answer I found to that was given by two mid-20th century women philosophers, Simone Weil, one of Brian Palmer's uh, uh, stars in the sky, rightly so, and um, I, another philosopher, Iris Murdoch. And both of them talked about the, the kind of radical decentering that comes about when you're in the presence of something beautiful. And the way in which Iris Murdoch said it was she said, she was trying to answer the question, what is it that makes us good? Not what makes us able to talk about being good or lecture about it or write about it, but actually be good. And she said, more than anything else, I think what helps us be good is what's commonly called beauty. And the, here's the account she gave, she said, I may be sitting there very preoccupied with my own reputation. I think my colleagues aren't giving me the, the respect I deserve. And suddenly I see a bird, a kestrel, lift off the ground. 
And all this concern of the self falls away. She referred to it as a process of unselfing, where she's just, it, it falls away, and all she cares about is watching this incredible bird. And the Simone Weil also talked about this as radical decentering. And I refer to it as an opiated adjacency. And here's why I like that term. There's, there's lots of things that give us an acute sense of pleasure. Um, and there's lots of things in the world that make us feel marginal or demoted or secondary. But very rarely do those two happen together. That at the very moment where you feel secondary, where you feel on the margins, um, you also feel this exhilarating pleasure. And that's what um, Iris Murdoch was describing at the moment of, uh, of seeing the bird lift off. So, um, and, and how does that relate to justice? Well, the, the equality across persons generally assumes that I have to move, well, let me back up a minute. I know, thank goodness, that I'm not the center of the world, but I certainly sometimes think I'm the center of my own world. Um, and yet, often, the kinds of work that need to be done to bring about greater situations of justice require that I stop being even at the center of my own world. So anything that puts me in touch with that ability to be lateral, to be marginal, um, is, is of assistance. And um, then we can go on, you know, maybe at another time and talk about the other two sites of beauty. So those are the three paths by which I think one can get to concern with justice. The, the non-exemption, uh, the, the path of privation or pain, and the path of beauty. Thank you. Uh, Seni Tenerelli. Hi. In the New York Times Magazine article, Professor Scary has a theory. Jamaica Kincaid is quoted as saying that you are the most just person she will ever know. As evidence, she points to your garden, that you are so committed to caring for the world, you even protect your plants. My question is, how do you cultivate attentive attentiveness in your daily life from the most quotidian or humble concerns to great questions of national life like the Patriot Act? And as an addendum, does your training in literary analysis help you in these efforts? Well, that, first of all, Jamaica Kincaid's statements like some of Brian Palmer's statements are expressive of their own large spiritedness, but I'll, I'll just take your, your question anyway and we'll, we'll assume for, um, for, for the sake of answering that, that all this is, is true. It's something to live up to, whether or not it's, it's true. Um, and I, I think that your question follows very well from, the, um, from the, the thing that I was talking about last, about the, the sight of, of beauty helping us to care about injury. Um, something like the garden um, is helpful to me because it, to always work on things that are very excruciating. Uh, and of course, reading about torture or reading about what's going in, on in Iraq or reading about you know, violations in our government are, however painful they are, they're obviously much <coughs> less painful than, let's say, in the case of Iraq, being a soldier or a civilian <coughs> there in Iraq. So I don't want to make a great big deal about how hard it is to keep reading about this material, because it's much easier than actually being there. Nonetheless, it's hard. And therefore, working with something like the texture of everyday life, in my case it's plants, but all of you have something that's like that. Maybe it's music, maybe it's writing poetry. Um, as one of my students once said, it reaffir reaffirms one's trust in the world. Um, one has to have a ground to stand on. One has to have a memory of what things can be in order to keep working. Otherwise, if you feel, if you see only the kind of ashes or residue of what's going wrong, um, it can be hard to keep critiquing it. And in the recent period, not so much in the last, say, five years, but there, there was a whole run of years where there was a kind of um, Foucauldian analysis that whether Foucault meant it or not, led people, in my view, misled people, into thinking everything's just a progressive stage of the same thing. 
and it's just as bad over here as it is here, so let's not make these pedantic distinctions. I don't think that Foucault really meant that, but I, I do know that that is often the way he was invoked or cited. And I think that that, first of all, is um, disenabling. It's disabling. It doesn't give you any ground to stand on to critique what is surely wrong. And as complicated as moral questions are in the world we live in, there are some rules that are very simple, like not to injure other people um, or to try and diminish injury where one can do so. Um, so the, I think that anything that, that blurs one's vision or dissuades one from um, trying to make those repairs is, contributes to the aversiveness and anything, even if it's as simple as, um, uh, as gardening, is, uh, is, is actually helping to restore the ground. Thanks, Thanks for the question. Joseph Kanzelman. Hello. Hello. In our uh, Resolving to Resist, you talk a lot about the freedoms that the Patriot Act violates um, in terms of American freedoms uh, and libraries and whatnot. But you don't mention anything that it has done that is good. And in fact, it's led to the arrest and help uh, in the apprehension of terrorists in over seven major cities, and it has led to the, the deportation of over 2,000 illegal aliens who may or may not have had terrorist intentions. Why do you focus so much on the right of, the right of Americans to have uh, freedoms, and you, you don't focus at all on the right from terror? Um, it's conceivable, and, and all of the cities that have written resolutions against the Patriot Act. In the, in the piece that, that you were asked to read, I give the numbers 238, because that's what it was when that Boston Review was going to press. It's now 289 cities, um, and includes very large cities like New York City and so forth. Um, and the, none of those uh, resolutions is blind to the fact that there may be some good provision in the Patriot Act there may be some provisions that probably should be kept. For example, it has one provision which allows for money to go to the family of firefighters who die fighting terrorism. That's probably not something that any of us would object to. Um, and yet, so, and so there may be some good provisions. Now anything which assists us in deporting illegal aliens, whether or not they did anything, is a big problem. Um, and so there, you and I would probably have a disagreement. Um, and you may know the, the figure that, that David Cole gives, that, it, that 5,000 foreign nationals have been arrested and held, only three of whom, only three of whom were eventually ever charged with terrorist-related charges, and two of those were acquitted. So out of 5,000 people, one out of the 5,000 actually did something which qualifies as a terrorist-related act. Um, and the other 4,999 uh, don't. That's a huge problem. As you may recall, I cite there the uh, Supreme Court case Zadvidas versus Davis, which says that due process in this country, um, which is located primarily in the 5th and 14th Amendments, applies whether you're a citizen whether you're a non-citizen, whether you're a legal alien, or whether you're an illegal alien. And the earlier 1976 case, Matthew V. Davis, said that the Bill of Rights, that's the amendments one through 10 in our Constitution, apply to everybody who's residing here, whether you have citizenship or not. But, so we, on the issue of deporting people, um, or in other cases, detaining people and imprisoning, pr imprisoning them, we have a big problem. I mean, we have a, a disagreement. Um, let me also say that it's not just that we've escorted foreign nationals to our jails and to the borders. We've also prevented many foreign nationals from coming into this country. Um, if a figure was given in a letter from the president of, I think it was Texas A&M, uh, a few days ago, 
on the drop-off in applications to higher education from students from other countries. And I, I think, and I, I'm, I'm just going to bracket this as, as figures that I believe are right, and you need to check them in uh, the, the op-ed pages in the New York Times, 78% drop-off in applications from India to schools of higher education in the United States, 59% drop-off in uh, applications from China, and 25% drop-off overall when you take all countries. Those are not applications any of us should want to see lost. That's, that's, you know, as that MIT in the public interest report says, I, I say it in one footnote, so if you didn't see it, it's interesting to look at it. MIT says, it's not just that we want to protect students and faculty and staff from foreign nationals, it's that our ability to do great research depends on having the most agile, talented people from the United States in every country of the world. So, but anyway, to, let me go back to your premise, which is, are there any good things in the Patriot Act? And yes, there, there are, and we could probably make a revised version of the Patriot Act that is much shorter, much, much shorter, but that has those good things in it. Um, and they're, they're just braided together with many things that are unnecessary and that are harmful. Kate Holbrook. Hi, Kate. I, I, I find it very courageous that you write about things that are outside of your specific literary field. And I think something that um, might prevent me from doing that kind of thing, I hope won't, is just fear that if I hadn't received a PhD in something, I wasn't qualified to discuss it. And I wonder whether your literary analysis skills translate well into these other fields, or whether you've developed new skills, and I wonder what kind of impact these expeditions away from literature have had on your career. Right. That's a good question, and, uh, and an important question, because I think people do feel afraid to go outside of their field. So let me, and, and you, there's no question about it that you do sometimes get punished for going outside your field. So I, I'm going to go on to say some positive things. But um, if, you, if you go outside your field, um, expect to have uh, some people laugh at you. But I'm sure that you can all bear up under that. Um, here's the thing. First of all, if you look in the past, the great work was always done by people who, who thought across fields. So John Locke said in a book called The Conduct of the Human Understanding, which is um, a work that we, of his that we don't often hear about. It's a little book. And he says in it, the fastest way to stop being able to think is to only read one, books in one field and only talk to people in one field. Those of you who are undergraduates, who are most of you, go to math at 8 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning and then to political philosophy at 11 and then to literature class at 1. You go to different fields. But as people go on working, we begin to think that they should only study and read and think in one field. Um, if you look at, at, I mean, Locke himself was a physician uh, and was in steady conversation with people, not just about individual health questions, um, and there, there was a famous doctor named Sydenham with whom he worked closely, but also with issues of public health. And yet we know him as a political philosopher. Uh, and there are many, uh, many, many, many other examples that can be cited of people who work in different fields. Now, in our own time, one thing to know is this, that when you do work in another field, the university, for all its faults, and it has faults, is a very generous place. So when I write law articles, I give those law articles at Yale Law School. I've just finished talking at Stanford Law School. Um, Chicago Law School, Harvard Law School, and those law professors are the best test for me of whether I'm saying something right or wrong, and I think they would point out that often if you're coming in from another field, you don't see through the received lenses and you see something that's obviously there and staring everyone in the face, but isn't seen just because none of the frames are being questioned. So. It's very important to realize that if you suddenly uh, work on, uh, on something in another field, there are 
generous hearts and minds and tough hearts and minds, and they'll let you know if it's second-rate work um, fast enough. The, the, um, I've given the example of law school, but at a certain point, I had to, for reasons too lengthy and, and not interesting probably to go into, I had to educate myself about um, electromagnetic theory. I, I, I have, I practically had to give myself an undergraduate education in this topic. But again, there were physicists and electrical engineers who not only read what I wrote, but were willing to talk on the phone and, uh, and, and uh, you know, help me test and make sure that I got the details right and that I, I wasn't unmindful of some important key term that uh, would, would you know, give me away as an outsider, uh, you know, that I needed to use this word or something. So it's, it's um, and then finally I would, I would add that I started answering Kate's question by saying, yes, you will be laughed at. Um, and even if, if I do something on law, um, certainly the, if I give it out of law school, uh, nobody is troubled about the fact that I'm an English professor, but let me talk on the radio, and I can guarantee you that the, one of the first questions will be, aren't you an English professor? And, um, and, and yet, I think that, that if you look at accounts of what inhibits people from doing good work in the world, um, one of the major things that inhibits people is the, the fear of looking foolish. Um, George Orwell said that. He said, it isn't that a gun is held to people's head, and that's why they don't do it. It isn't, it's because they feel shame, and they feel foolish, um, and they feel people are, are going to laugh at them. And uh, Edward Said has said similar things, and Stuart Hampshire has said similar things. Um, it's, it's the, the thing that one, I, I, I sometimes think it's the thing one needs to most be on guard against. Um, because everyone thinks that, gee, if I lived in that era where these people allowed terrible things to happen, I know I would have stood up. They must have been, uh, you know, uh, they must have not had courage or something like that. Whereas often it's really just a matter of uh, feeling, feeling silly. Uh, so if you feel silly, now I say to myself, if I feel silly, it's probably a sign that I should continue. Um, and one of the good things about working on different subjects, I mean, literature is the first love and a uh, home base and so on and so forth, um, but it, it's, you know, one of the, the good things is that you never do feel like an expert. You never feel that. It's always new. It's always fresh. You're always feeling what it feels like to learn and never, uh, you know, you never get to enjoy the kind of uh, swagger of professional expertise, but it's actually more pleasurable, I think, to just keep seeing all the, you know, uh, uh, small pieces anyway, of what there is to see in the world. The floor is open. Hi. Actually, Hi. this touches a bit upon what you were just speaking on. Um, I had a question about the appropriateness of city and local governments taking a stand on sort of a national issue. I mean, I'm not saying citizens don't have a right for sort of taking a stand with this for such an issue, but I mean, isn't the action more appropriate for them writing to their legislator, for writing to the executive branch, um, that kind of action, instead of local governments, which were created for organizing and sort of maintaining just um, civil affairs concerning the city, sort of trying to take stands on more abstract issues, like even issues of war. I mean, during the Iraq war, there was a whole spate of cities, more liberal cities, putting out um, resolutions saying they do not support it. But how much really, how effective is that, and how much is that really in their jurisdiction or their um, power, really? Well, yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, and the, I mean, in my own view, the this grassroots movement that's moving town by town um, is, is very thrilling because it isn't just saying something on paper. 
Um, that is, it isn't just announcing that this is a, uh, you know, we have some Cambridge uh, statements such as we're a nuclear-free zone, even though we have a nuclear reactor down near MIT, and this is domestic violence-free zone, and, uh, and I mean, it's important to say those things, but one can't enforce it uh, necessarily. The, the, the town resolutions against the Patriot Act are self-enacting. They actually do, are impeding the executive government from doing what it is trying to do. That's why um, Attorney General Ashcroft made his tour of cities to try and convince people to, um, to stand by the Patriot Act because the fact that all these cities were saying they wouldn't uh, assist was uh, imperiled the work that he wanted to do. Um, let, me, let me try and, and say it more clearly. Because we're not needed, there are certain things where our help isn't needed. For example, probably none of us in this class are soldiers and probably none of us have siblings who are um, in Iraq right now. Um, and as you know, that's widespread throughout universities and, and Congress. And therefore, what we think about the war is, you know, the executive can just shrug. It doesn't, the war can go forward without us. In certain other things that I've written, it, it tries to explain why I think there has to be a distributed military, um, which is, you know, a very controversial issue that, that I would be glad to talk about. Um, but in the case of the, the Patriot Act, the, the local towns actually do have the power to, uh, to, to impede the work by, because they say to the local police, um, do not go in to uh, people's houses without telling them that you're going into their house. As you know, um, one of the provisions of the Patriot Act allows the executive branch of the government to go into a house without notifying you for seven days and it, 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 the, the Fourth Amendment requires that you be told before they go into the house and search and that you be shown a search warrant that tells exactly what it was that they needed to go into your um, house for. Um, now they can go in without telling you and what these resolutions say, just for example, is the local police should not help anyone go into somebody's house. These town resolutions, by the way, are written hand in hand with the police. They don't just put this on the shoulders of the police. They talk to the police department and say, what phrasing would best help you uphold the, the um, Constitution um, because we want to do it in a way that's helpful to you, not in a way that makes it difficult. And the town resolutions also say certain things such as you know, putting up a warning sign in the, the libraries so that people are informed that um, their, their records may be looked at and so forth. So don't you think that, I mean, I, I would, I myself would think that local actions are good even if they don't have that concrete locus um, that in this case they do have. But at least in this case where there's such a concrete outcome, uh, I think it can be very good. And the courts and Congress have both begun to reach decisions that are compatible with these town resolutions passed by the cities. Um, for example, towards the end of the article, I cite various congressional acts that are on the floor of Congress right now. And various congressmen have said, it's been a long time since anything has received so much public attention and debate and deliberation as has now come forward with these towns and we've got to address it. The actions of the courts, I mean, as, as you know, in late January of this year, a LA federal court uh, for the first time ruled a section of the Patriot Act unconstitutional. So it's having its effect. And when you were posing the question, you said, would it perhaps be better to try and influence senators and congressmen um, and executive rather than taking action oneself? But actually that second thing is happening along with the first thing because Congress is, is so watchful to um, the, public, uh, uh, dis, you know, the public upset over this. It's now close to 20% of the United States population uh, that, that is resisting the Patriot Act. 
Have I answered that? You, you look like maybe I haven't. Absolutely, and that's a good point. And in some cases, there was a big town meeting, but that wouldn't be nearly all of the citizens. In some cases, it's the town council, but after people have gotten signed petitions from people in the town, um, there are no doubt some towns where it's only the town councils, who, who, councilmen and women who are elected, but they didn't necessarily check with their citizens. Um, and I think there's a wide variety on this point. I've heard of some cities where, uh, I, I think in two cases, where the resolution was actually brought about by someone who turned out to be 17 years old but went out and got signatures and so on and so forth, but, and then was eventually taken to the city council and passed. But yes, there's, 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 wide, um, there's wide variation. Thank you for coming, Professor Scary. Um, as you discussed just now, and, and in your essay on the difficulty of imagining other, per other people, constitutions and legal enforcements um, are necessary steps to promoting justice and compassion. But beyond these steps, how do we combat de facto injustice that persists despite these laws? In the, for example, the way that schools are um, terribly se segregated now, even, even though board versus Brown versus the Board of Education happened 50 years ago. Well, I'm sure that I'm sure that this is something that you've been addressing in here all all semester. But I mean, first of all, I would say that it's important to to stand by the laws. That is, in my view, people often think that a law is a, a kind of dull procedural matter, whereas the fact that you have the law means that, and in this case, the, the Fourth Amendment and the you know, Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments the, the, that these towns are all citing in their resolutions against the Patriot Act, um, it's important to reaffirm that we all stand by those laws. And you know, even in the case of the uh, school segregation that you're talking about, it may be that the laws that exist um, can be brought to bear on it as well as other things. So I would never turn my back on the laws. And the reason I stress this is something that is of greatest concern for me, if there's a single issue that, that is alarming to me, it is our nuclear weapons. And um, you know, we have, uh, and maybe this is something you've discussed in here a great deal, but. We have a huge buildup of nuclear weapons in the 1990s during the period when people, we all talked as though the Cold War is over and nuclear weapons are a thing of the past. Just to give you the quick figures, our strategic arsenal is centered in 18 Ohio-class submarines, each carrying the equivalent of 4,000 Hiroshimas. And eight of those 18 Ohio-class submarines were commissioned and christened during the 1990s. Uh, you know, after the Berlin Wall had fallen. Now, <clears throat> this is relevant to your question because in my view, there are pieces of the Constitution that if they were just brought to bear on it would make it impossible. International law has certainly been tried. Some of you may know that in 1995, 87 countries went to the International Court of Justice and asked that the United States nuclear weapons and the nuclear weapons of other uh, nuclear club holders be declared illegal. And some of the people there, I mean, they, they all argued that the non-proliferation treaty signers were getting impatient. They had signed that treaty with the understanding that people who had nuclear weapons would give them up. Um, and instead, people were increasing them. At that time, India did not have a nuclear weapon. It stood in the court and pleaded with the court to declare them illegal on the grounds that they, were, they violated rules of proportionality. North Korea did not have nuclear weapons. They were there in that court arguing that nuclear weapons should be declared um, illegal. Um, the, the Middle Eastern state of Qatar 
was there, Iran was there, Japan was there, the Marshall Islands where we've exploded 66 atomic bombs was there. Um, what did we say? What did we say? We said that our nuclear weapons, contrary to what all these folks were saying, our nuclear weapons did not violate um, the Geneva Accords, did not violate the Hague regulations, did not violate the, the rules on genocide. We actually argued that, that they don't violate the rules on genocide. What, what we said, and by we it was a combination of the Department of Defense and the Department of State. They said that merely killing millions of people doesn't count as genocide. It only counts as genocide if you've targeted one national group. Um, okay, so it does not violate genocide, does not violate the Vienna agreements on the ozone layer, does not violate the Rio uh, on the on environment. So um, putting, putting aside the international law, and by the way, we said that it was not illegal to own them, to threaten to use them, to use them or to use them first. I know this sounds so harsh, it sounds like I'm making it up, but it's the case. Now, in our own constitution are elements that can be brought to bear on this. And I could tell you, talk about this at great length, one is the, uh, one, Article 1, Section 8, which requires a congressional declaration of war, which you can't have if you're living in a nuclear war state. And the other is the right to bear arms, which requires that the authorization for injuring foreign people be distributed to all of us and not be decided by a small cadre of people. If we were ever to use those, people would say, not only that we use them, but that in every desk, in every home, was a tool that could have been brought to bear to stop it. So in my view, the, um, the, the, it's important to keep using the laws and to keep using them in the things you're worried about, of segregation um, and so forth. But the, you know, uh, going along with that certainly are ways of talking to people, trying to persuade people. Um, I, I, you referred to the piece I wrote called The Difficulty of Imagining Other People, which is basically arguing that if, if you believe, uh, if you want to try and diminish injury, um, the best way to do it is through the law because it doesn't depend on maintaining goodwill. It, it, if you get everyone to agree, let's have a better, a fairer school system, what, are they still going to agree next month and two years from now? And if you move away, will they agree five years from now? But if it's a matter of the law, then there's something that can, um, that, that can help maintain it. Um, literature can play a very important role in, uh, in persuading people. Um, the philosopher Richard Rorty has said, has noted how often we go to literature to find out what it's like to be another person. Um, and I even think that literature is tremendously helpful because it can make us see times when we're failing to s appreciate the full weight of other human beings. But I, I feel, as you know from that piece very strongly, that the, the laws uh, that one should continue to, to really uh, stand by and ask that the laws be used to, to, bring, to, to remedy wrongs. Earlier you were talking about uh, how few people at universities are involved with the military. Could you talk some more about your ideas about a proportional military? Yeah, I, I can. And, you know, the right to bear arms, um, as I say, this is something that, that may be distressful to you to say because though, like many other sensible people, I used to be opposed to the draft, I now think that there are many arguments in favor of bringing the draft back. And the reason for that is, of course, we all dread being drafted ourselves or having someone in our family drafted. But that aversiveness of being drafted puts the standard really high for what an argument for going to war has to sound like. And right now, the, the, we're all so far removed that the most preposterous arguments for going to, to war um, can be given as, as we've seen. Uh, and uh, the, the notion that we should all share responsibility for military decisions 
is right there on the right to bear arms, which is a, a distributional argument. We now think of it as something that just protects the right of criminals to carry guns or the right of people to go to gun clubs. That isn't what it's about. Um, and the, the right to bear arms is something that is antecedent to any question about how much injuring power the country's going to have. And the fastest way I can illustrate that is to, to and, and by antecedent I mean, okay, we're all responsible for how much injuring power we're, our country's going to have and how much it's going to use. Now, we may decide we're going to have zero, or we may decide we're going to have a great deal. But I say that it's antecedent because whatever it is, we're going to get to decide it. We're going to talk to one another and we're going to decide it. And you can see the, that this is antecedent to the question of whether you have it or not by looking at the fact that it is a principle that is saluted not just by militarists, by pac but by pacifists. So the militarists, Mirabeau and the French Revolution, said that the cause of injustice in France was the unequal distribution of arms. But so too, Gandhi said, of all the evil acts committed by Britain against India, the worst is the disarming of the people. Give us back our arms, and then we'll tell you whether we're going to use them or not. Now, Gandhi would, of course, go on to say we're not going to use them. But to be in a situation where we seeded all questions about whether we're going to go to war, and then we're going to have to petition and, and plead and put on demonstrations, which I, of course, think we should do. But it, it should be that the capacity of the United States population to act as a break on injuring foreign people is there and in place before you go to war, not after you, you go to war. Um, now, I don't, I, I at this point think that probably the best way to do that is uh, to reinstitute the draft. Um, and though we don't want the draft, even less than we, than we want it, the executives don't want it because they don't want to have to uh, actually explain themselves. And you know, President Bush said to Bob Woodward, that's the interesting thing about being a president. You don't need to explain anything you do. Um, well, actually, if you've got a military drawn from the few full population, you do have to explain what it is you're, you're going to do. Thank you. 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 Thank you.